comes to sing, when it was written by Wesley, I forgot what years, I was looking at it this week, it started out with 17 stanzas. <laughs> That's a lot of stanzas. From the inside out, make it your prayer to worship our great God and give him everything that he is deserving of. Here and as we leave these four walls, may we spread the word of God. Glory to 
the song we sang in that last phrase, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise. From the inside out, Lord, my soul cries out. I hope you're here today with a heart that is here to worship God. He is deserving of our praise. Christ is enough for us. In the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. When you made that decision, you realize the commitment that we are supposed to do on this earth is to spread that word and follow Jesus. Be that shining light for him. We are the light of the world. And we're supposed to be out there sharing his great joy that he died on the cross for our sins. We shouldn't keep that to ourselves. We have to share that with everyone else. Through every trial. 
announcement, you get to do all of the announcements. So, I'm giving him the day off. Um, we just have two announcements. Well, this church is upstairs today for kids K through two. That's the third announcement. Um, there is going to be a ladies craft day on February 16th, starting at nine. If you're the on time kind of person, but you can come whenever suits you, and you can leave whenever you have to leave, but you have to leave at 3 o'clock. <laughs> Lunch and snacks will be provided. Um, you will have table space and electric. There will be a sewing machine if you just have to bring your own thread. I don't sew, so that's not for me. Um, and if you are not a crafter, but you want to craft, there will be um, a couple of things that you could do. You could learn to make soap, or you could make some cards. So if you would feel like God is telling you to come hang out with the ladies of this church and be crafty, um, you can sign up on the back. Lunch and snacks will be provided. I don't know if that. <coughs> the area is weird up here. Um, and if you have any questions, don't come to me. Come see, go see Carrie Claypool or Sue Krakowska. Now, some of you might think that I'm wearing these sunglasses because I don't like to talk in front of all of you, <laughs> but that's not the case. Uh, this month's item for Operation Christmas Child is accessories. And I'm wearing double sunglasses because my husband, who does not come to church, when, I was, when we started the Operation Christmas Child ministry, I was telling him, you know, and I was excited about it, and he's like, does it really, does it really work, or is it one of those things that you just do, and so we started YouTubing videos of Operation Christmas Child, and in all of the videos, the kids were super excited about sunglasses, so we watched these videos for probably 45 minutes, which, you know, what better way to spend a Saturday night, but when we got all done, <coughs> I said to my husband, do you believe me now that this is a valuable ministry? And he said, yeah, and you know what I learned? He goes, you better make sure there's a pair of sunglasses in every one of the shoeboxes that you send away. So that's my own personal story about accessories. But watches. super excited that she decided that she had to put all of them in her hair at one time. So, you know, the littlest things, I mean, all of these things you can get at Dollar Tree. So, that's, that's it. Thank you, Cindy. For those, um, last week they announced that a lot of our leadership and uh, small groups are going through this book called Letters to the Church. I had a couple copies last week, and if, if anybody was interested, you feel free to get a hold of me and I'd give them a copy. Well, there's good news. I'm out of them. Again. So, I'm going to be reordering some books, so if you don't have one and you would like to get one, just let me know so I can make sure that uh, we include you in the <coughs> We also want to thank uh, Pastor Cook for coming out today. He's going to be sharing the gospel with us here this morning, but before he comes up, Let's look to the, the Lord in prayer for our offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you again for the men and ladies in this room, the commitment that they have to you, Lord, to come together and worship you corporately, Lord. And thank you that we have that freedom here in this country to not just work, worship you corporately, but individually throughout the week on our own time as well, Lord. Lord, we also want to thank you for Pastor Cook is able to come out here this morning and share from his heart the, your word with us, Lord, and challenge us as we leave here today. And Lord, just thank you for these gifts that we're going to be receiving. And Lord, we just pray that they're given with a joyful and grateful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
kids can be dismissed. Remember, yeah. we're upstairs today, kids. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here today with you. I don't even feel like this is uh, outside of my, uh, my zone here because uh, I live right down here in Asheville, so it's a fun thing to be able to come on over a few miles to, uh, to Panama. My kids uh, all graduated from Panama High School, and so uh, I feel right at home being here among you and my wife, Mary Kay. And so thanks for inviting us to, uh, to be a part of this, um, this service today. I actually... Um, uh, for those of you who might not know me, I pastored the church in Lakewood for about 30 years, uh, Lakewood Baptist Church, which is behind the Dairy Queen, used to be Dairy Queen, now the 50s restaurant. And uh, we were always hoping that we could be distinguished in saying that our church was, uh, uh, that the 50s restaurant was uh, by Lakewood. Uh, you know, you always end up going one direction or the other there, and people seem to know where their food is coming from, so they always t said that we were behind the Dairy Queen. But uh, good to be here with you today, and um, I promise that I will do my best to get you out before the Super Bowl tonight. Um, we, uh, you know, it's in interesting when I think about all of that goes on as far as the, this day in the Super Bowl, uh, the amount of attention that's given to it is, uh, blows my mind. I was actually looking up the, uh, about the commercials that were done a year ago at the Super Bowl, and each commercial, 30 seconds, cost $5.5 million. Can you imagine that? $5.5 million, because they figured that it was worth it to do that because there was about a 100 million uh, person audience that was going to be watching that. And so that's huge, and, uh, but it seems like it's, it's just become a priority on the part of so many that they want to be there. Now, I will tell you, I will be watching it as well, uh, trying to uh, hope that the Rams will finally outdo the uh, Patriots. Uh, oh. But uh, I was reading a story about a fellow who uh, actually won uh, tickets to the Super Bowl, and when he finally got to the stadium, he was, he was really excited, but then he saw that his seat was in the far back corner of the stadium, which kind of depressed him a little bit, and so he thought that I'm going to try to see if I can find uh, a seat that's, that's better. And of course, uh, at the Super Bowl, you're not going to find any empty seats that are around, and so he was looking around, looking around, and, and uh, to his amazement, he actually found a seat that was on the 50-yard line down near the field sitting uh, next to this, this uh, middle-aged fella. And so he comes down and he gets to the, the field and he talks to this guy and he says, hey, uh, um, surprised to see that there's a seat that, that, that's down here. Is uh, this seat um, occupied? Is it taken? And the guy said no. And he said, I, I can't believe it. On the Super Bowl, that, that this seat would not be taken. I mean, this is, this is amazing to me. And the guy said, well, he said, the seat, the seat is actually my wife's, and, um, but she passed away. And so he felt real bad about that and, uh, and said, well, uh, and the guy said, you know, my wife and I attended the Super Bowl every year uh, for as many years as we were, were married, but she passed away. And so the guy says, well, couldn't you find a, a friend or a relative to actually come along and to, and to sit with you uh, at, the, at the game here? And he said, no, they're all at the funeral. So. <laughs> you got it, okay, we, we're there, good, good. Um, yeah, don't take me too seriously. Uh, but I am amazed at the, at the way that things have, uh, have changed over the years to see how, uh, how people are just uh, gravitated to coming to uh, you know, what, what is done even on Sundays. The 21st century church in America is changing. I don't think I really have to tell you a whole lot about that on, other than the fact that it's not uncommon for even church members to attend uh, one or two Sundays uh, a month and then do whatever they choose to do on the other Sundays uh, of the, uh, that are there. Public schools, some of you may remember this if you're a little older, but public schools used to uh, hold off Sundays and Wednesday nights for the, the purposes that the church would have instead of having their activities and sporting events and so forth, but today 
Uh, families attend tournaments, uh, matches, games uh, on every day of the week, and it's interesting, especially it takes place on Sundays, even in high school. Um, we can't do much about what the world is doing, but it's worth our time to rethink about what the church should be doing, okay? I, I, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, what is the, the mission of the church? And you'll find in the back of your bulletin that there is an outline that's there that if you want to follow along, do so. And I certainly would encourage you to uh, take your iPhone or your iPad or your, the Bible that's in the pew in front of you or the seat in front of you and to turn to the scriptures that I'm going to be sharing. Uh, I will be uh, putting them up on the screen as well if you didn't have a Bible with you today. Uh, when I retired in 2015, the Family Life Network uh, wanted to uh, do a, an interview with me regarding retirement. And I was asked, how do you see the role of the church changing over the next 30 years? And I said, you know, with problems escalating at home and abroad, people in and out of the church are worried. Uh, they're worried about the breakdown of the family and its influence upon the kids, their kids and their grandkids. They're worried about the, the lack of moral restraint and, and especially the redefinition of what is right and wrong on their part versus what God says is right and wrong. Chaos in the streets with addictions too numerous to count and uh, society has gone wild in terms of disregard for uh, the sanctity of life. In fact, I was thinking about that, and uh, I had written a letter back in 2013 to our governor, and I said, you know, many things have been accomplished uh, by you, and you should be congratulated for that, but I'm saddened over your continual push of late-term abortions. Now, this is 2013. I said, I just conducted a funeral of an 18-week-old little girl who was named Samantha, and I wish you could have seen the pictures on the poster board of this fully developed infant whose heart continued beating one half hour after being miscarried from the womb. If you saw what I did, you'd know that this is not fetal tissue. This is a human being made in the image of God. To encourage ext extinguishing such a life in my estimation constitutes murder and places us in the same category as Adolf Hitler. I know this wording is harsh, but it's true. Mr. Governor, we are all concerned over the mother's health and would obviously do whatever it takes to protect her. But the loophole is broad regarding the health of the mother versus the health of the unborn. I ask you, as a citizen of New York State, to please protect the life of the unborn. You have the power in your position to be a change agent for good. You have fought hard in regarding the education of children in New York State. Please do likewise in protecting the unborn so that they can become citizens of our state. That was in 2013. Little did I know that a week ago there was going to be legislation to allow uh, abortions to take place uh, right up until full term, right through that. In fact, if the child were actually born, then the emphasis was you don't do anything. If the child's born alive, you don't do anything. And I, I don't know about you, but that just sickens me. And I'm not here to talk about that today, but just to tell you, this is, this is the society that we are living in today. And with these problems comes the challenge for the church in the coming years. And I think it's a positive one, because when the black of darkness becomes blacker, then the light becomes more visible more evident, and more welcoming. And so therefore, I think that the church has a great responsibility and a great opportunity. In fact, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 says this, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We need to let that light shine today. Is that right? Are you in agreement with me? It's, it's, it's more important today than ever before that we do that. The good news is we have the answer to the world's problems, and his name is Jesus. But if the church is going to be the light and the salt of the earth, as Matthew 5 says that we should be, then we must, as a church, refocus on what is our mission. 
And I'd like to ask you that this morning. What is the mission of Panama Baptist Church? Why do you exist? Why are you here in this community? Do you know what business you're in? Well, you know what? You've got it right over the top of my head. Because you are to love God and you are to love others. In fact, there's a verse there in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. And uh, would you read that with me? Can you see it up there? All right, here's what it says. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I really am appreciative of how you, you have stated this in such a simple fashion. We're to love God. We're also to love other people. In fact, I was looking at your bulletin, and if you take a look on the very inside, you'll see a, a section there marked our mission. And um, here's, what, here's what part of that says. It says, we will strive to be a multi-generational church ministering to each generation, desiring their gifts, abilities, and uniqueness above our own, manifesting them through the body of Christ. The mission statement would, be compel, would also compel us to look beyond our four walls and look into the community and share the love of Christ. Would you say, look beyond our walls? Look beyond our four walls? That's, that's what we need to do. We need to, you're not just here to be comfortable. You are here to do a mission for the Lord. And I, I want to just share that today. I don't think what I'm sharing with you is going to be anything that is, um, that's new to you. Uh, in fact, that's the danger of a pastor who has shared in churches before of sharing something that's very familiar and trying to bring it home again. But I would seek to do that today. Jesus would be in approval of your mission statement because he said in John chapter 17, verse 18, as thou, God, did send me into the world, I also send them, that's you and me, into the world. Say, in the world. He wants us to go there. He wants us to go in the world. Now, uh, why does he want us to be sent into the world? What are we sent to do? What is our mission? Well, in Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul was experiencing hardship and persecution, and he made a final farewell address to the people that were uh, in Ephesus. Now, this church that was in Ephesus was one that he actually planted. And here's what he said in, in Acts chapter 20 and verses 22 through 24. Paul says, And now, bound in spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me, but I do not consider my life as a, any account as dear to myself, in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord. Finish my course and the ministry which the Lord gave to him. What was that ministry? What was that course? What was that mission? To testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Stated another way, to tell people the good news about Jesus Christ and his grace. That's why you're, you're here. That's why, that's why I'm here is to be able to testify of the good news. Now, the original word for gospel in the, in the original Greek is the word evangelon. It's the word that we get evangelism from. And so the Apostle Paul was saying, we need to evangelize people. And if I were putting it in the context of this church today, we need to look beyond our four walls and evangelize or share the good news with people that are outside of this church right now. You exist here for the people that are on the outside. Now, otherwise, why wouldn't the Lord, on the day that we accepted him as personal Savior, why wouldn't he just take us home to heaven? Well, because he's got a mission for us to do. And so where is the community that you and I are supposed to share this good news? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Again, it's so familiar. I hope that it won't slip over the top of what we're supposed to be thinking about here. Acts 1.8 says, And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, when Jesus spoke these words to his followers, where were they? They were in Jerusalem. They were in their hometown. And he was saying to them, in essence, I want you to start your witness. I want you to start evangelizing right here at home. The people that are closest in proximity to you in your own community. Then he says, I want you to go to, to Judea and Samaria. And uh, that's like the, the, the county next door or, or a, a people next door. The Samaritans were of a different culture than the Jewish people were. They were half Jew, half Samaria, or half a Gentile. And so he therefore says, I want you to go to people nearby, but people that are different from you. And I want you to share the gospel with them. And then he says, I want you to go to the remotest part of the earth, or the ends of the earth, depending upon your translation. And that simply means, I want you to go to everybody else. And so he wants us to go to everyone. Now, what, what is a witness? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to witness. You shall be my witnesses. Well, again, this borders on simplicity here, but uh, a witness is a person who tells what he has seen or experienced. And as a witness, you simply tell what has happened to you because you are the best authority on what's taken place in your life. Uh, not your deacons, not your spouse, not your parent, you. You're the best authority on what God is doing or has done in your life. And so 1 John 1, 3 says, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship with us. So God says, I want you to tell other people what has happened to you, people that are close to you, people who are nearby but are different from you, and people everywhere else. I want you to share what has happened to you. I once heard a missionary share the difference between evangelists and missionaries, and he said an evangelist shares Christ in his own culture, and a missionary shares Christ in a cross-culture. Says it's the same mission, just a different culture. I thought that was pretty good. So to summarize where we've been so far, first of all, I must share with those in my world, in my hometown. Now, if you have your Bible, I would like you to just, uh, or your iPad or whatever, look up Luke chapter 8. Now, I'm going to have part of this up here on the screen. But in order for us to understand what has taken place here, this is, again, a familiar story for those of you that are familiar with the New Testament. But I would like you to see a story about a guy who was demon-possessed, who was acting out of his mind because he was being controlled by Satan. Now, in this story, Jesus heals this man. And I'd like you to just listen to the account. I'm not going to try to explain it so much as to just have you listen to the account and what Christ tells this man to do. Verse 26 of Luke chapter 8. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he had come out onto the land, he was met by a certain man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. And seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had been commanding the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would burst his fetters by being driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they were entreating him not to command them to depart into the abyss. And there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons entreated him to permit them to enter the swine, and he gave them permission. Verse 33, And the demons came out from the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. And when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. 
And the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they became frightened. Now that, I don't know about you, but that seems a little strange to me. I would have thought, and they became excited for this man. But no, no, they became frightened. Verse 36, and those who had uh, seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. That's witnessing. And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him, Jesus, to depart from them, for they were gripped with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. That's a sad thing, isn't it? Here Jesus had just healed this man. He was in his right mind. And they said, Jesus, go away from us. But, verse 38, the man whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him, but he sent him away saying, now this is the part that I want you to see. He sent him away saying, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. That tells us what we're supposed to do in our hometown. That tells us what we are supposed to do to the, in this community. Return to your house. Return to your hometown. And for those of us that are here today, I think that that means go back to your family. Go back to the people at your job, the person in the post office, in the grocery store, down here at Panama Diner. Uh, go back to your classmates in school. Go back to the nursing home. Go back and tell them what great things God has done for you. That's witnessing. Simply telling from your own experience what God has done for you. Why don't we do this? I mean, why don't we do this more in our lives? Well, in my opinion, we have come to the belief that, uh, and a myth, the myth that people aren't interested in spiritual issues today. And I don't think anything could be farther from the truth. Did you know that on an average day in Chautauqua County, that 18% of the people attend church? 18 out of 100 are going to church this morning. And even though 65 million people have no church home in America, polls that have been taken over and over again indicate that over half of those unchurched people would attend if someone would just invite them. They're waiting for your invitation. This past uh, week I was um, talking with a lady who's 91 years old who just entered a skilled care nursing facility in our area. Uh, she was a little uncomfortable because she had um, actually gone from uh, another nursing home situation, but it wasn't skilled care, and she ended up having to move in with somebody that was uh, being a roommate uh, for her, and she hadn't had this before. And, and she told me, and I, I, I was listening to her closely because she, she said to me, uh, you know, I can't do much anymore. My energy's kind of leaving uh, after so many years. She said, but I still can pray, and I still can preach. <laughs> I love that. I love that, because I don't usually hear people saying, I can preach. But that's good. Uh, how shall I hear, it says in Romans, without a preacher? You know, that's you and me. How, how can they hear without somebody telling them about the Lord? Well, she said, I began praying for my roommate, who was quite bitter and lonely, and I told her that if she allowed Jesus to be a part of her life, that Jesus would be with her, and he would, and if she turned to him, that he'd listen to her. She said that um, the lady did not want to hear more about that, and she actually asked to be transferred downstairs to another person uh, that was another friend downstairs. Well, when they did that, they made the transfer. And the day that I was there, this, uh, this 90-year-old lady told me, she says, you know, something's changed. Because the lady now has asked to be able to come back up to my room because she wants to be with me. 
And I thought, you know what? It's no wonder she wants to be with you. Because you are a lady that's providing her with hope. And people need hope today. They need to know that there's answers. No matter what their age is, they need to have hope. This past year, my wife and I were praying for a couple, um, this couple, non-Christian, non-churched, but they uh, were interested in being able to talk, and, uh, and I, uh, so I had gone up to their home, and, and I knew that I talked with this lady on a previous uh, time uh, when I had to take her to Buffalo because she was dying of cancer. And, and I knew that. I knew that she was having a tough time, but she's a fighter. And I love that about her. But she uh, ended up going to uh, Roswell. We had a chance to talk at a, uh, at a uh, Wendy's restaurant. But then uh, she didn't want to talk too much about it anymore. But when she was coming more to the, uh, to the conclusion of her life, she asked if, um, if I would come and talk to her. And so I did. I went up to her, her home and uh, began to, to share with her about Jesus' love for her and about how much he wanted to be able to help her during her time of, of where she was going to. I said, it's, it's no secret that uh, you're, you're dying. Where, where are you going to spend your eternity? And uh, as we talked about that, she stopped me for a moment. She, she called. She says, can I call in my husband? And I said, by all means. And so she called him in, and she says, I want you to listen to this. And we began to share about Christ and about uh, how, she said, well, you know, I've, I've not been a church goer, and, and uh, my husband have, hasn't. And uh, they were disgruntled because of something that happened years ago. Many people do that. They blame the church, and so they don't come anymore. But she said, uh, you know, I... I'm not a church goer, and I said, you know what? I've got some good news from you, for you. I said, there's a story in the Bible about uh, Jesus as he was on the cross. There were two others that were there on the cross that day with him. And I said, both of those men were hurling abuse at Christ. They were criticizing him, saying, if you'd be the son of God, get yourself down, get us down too. That, you know, that's life survival. They wanted to live. But then we know that one of them had a change of heart, right? And one of them ended up saying, Jesus, when you enter into your kingdom, uh, would you remember me? And Christ said to that person, today, you'll be with me in paradise. And I said, you know, that person made that choice at the very end of his life and would experience eternity with the Lord from then on out. Isn't that beautiful? I told that to this lady, and she said, I want to talk more. The family all came um, at that point in time. And I said, you know, uh, would you like to talk tomorrow morning? We can do that. And that was on a Sunday, and I was just going to not go to church, but to talk with them. And she said, yeah, I would. Well, she died that night, but I really hope and pray that she understood the gospel message and that she made that response in her life. Why should we care to witness if we are, know that we're bound for heaven, that we're going to go to heaven? Why should we care? And you know, I would just simply say because Jesus cares. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Well, let's, let's hold off on that. I'll back up just in a few moments. When I was, my wife and I were talking with this lady, before we ever talked with her and before I talked with her husband as well, we did what is called the three open prayer. Now in your bulletin, you're going to see down at the very bottom, it says open prayer. You might want to just jot this down. What's the three open prayer? It's not original with me at all. Some of you have heard the name Ron Hutchcraft. He's the one that spoke about this, and ever since he did that, I've been praying this prayer for people that are in my home area, hometown or whatever. And that is, first of all, open their heart. Open their heart, Lord. Open the person's heart that I'm going to be talking to or whatever. Open their heart. John 6.44 says that uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so, Lord, open their heart. <laughs> Secondly, open the opportunity. And, you know, if you pray that, the Lord will do that. He will be more than happy to do that. 
Third prayer is probably the one that's most crucial for you, and that is open my mouth. Let me speak. And you know, I think that the Apostle Paul actually prayed this three open prayer in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. Is that up there? Can we get that there? Here it is. Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God may open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I was also imprisoned in order that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders making the most of the opportunity. That's a wonderful prayer. What a great prayer to be praying for people in your family, in your hometown, and also uh, all around the world to pray for them. Why should we do it? Because the Lord wants us to do it. Second Peter 3, 9 says that God is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So we must share with those that are home, in our home area, and also to be daring to share be, uh, with those that are beyond my world, people who are different than, than me, different than you and me. A while back, uh, a member of a local church, I heard them share that uh, because finances were going down in the church, that they ought to give less to outside missions and just worry about growing our church in putting our money here because they said that there's enough opportunities right here in our community. Well, I don't deny the fact that there's enough opportunities, but you know, the, the right or the wrong question to ask is should we reallocate our missions budget to support the, the church right here? The right question is should anyone be left behind? And the answer is no, no one. Um, anyone not willing to share their faith beyond their home area is in essence saying to the world, you can go to hell, I know I'm going to heaven, and I hope you get there. But I think we, we dare not have that attitude. The apostle Paul wouldn't have had that attitude. In fact, he was intolerant of selfish, self-centered thinking. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19, and then 22 and 23 says this, For though I am a free, free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do all these, uh, all these things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. In other words, I think Paul was saying, um, I don't just hang around with people who are like me. I also go and share this way of salvation with people who are different from me, but I want them to become fellow partakers of the gospel with me. Christians are called to reach out, to go outside of their own area. In fact, you know, you can't spell God without go. You can't spell the gospel without go. You can't spell good news without go. You and I simply have to go. We have to go to people that are at home, and we need to dare beyond, uh, to go beyond our own home into the community, outside people that are different than us, and to share. And last but not least, we need to care about the whole world. We need to care because God cares. Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 says, go into what? All the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Circle the words all. We need to go to everybody. Jesus wasn't simply talking to pastors or to missionaries at this time. He was talking to common, ordinary people of different occupations that were just simply followers of him like you and I are, but he wanted them to obey his, his marching orders. And he says to his followers, go everywhere because people everywhere deserve to hear the good news. And you know what? It's become easier for us in our, in our generation. Uh, back in the mid-1900s, do you, you recall how difficult it was to be able to, to, to go to other places? It would take such a long time, but because of technology, you could have written 
uh, an email to Andy and Mara Cook at the start of this message, and you could have had it back before the end. Because it's just gotten, the world has gotten so much smaller. But it's not just going all the way out. People are coming to us from all different cultures, from all different generations. They are here. And we need to make sure that we are sharing the gospel with them. My wife and I were just talking about this just uh, today, uh, about how difficult it is sometimes to, to talk to people that are of the uh, Eastern religions like Muslim. But you know, they need the gospel too. They, everyone needs to hear the gospel of Christ. And if you pray that three open prayer, Lord, open their heart. Open the opportunity. Open my mouth. He'll do it because he cares. Now, why should we care beyond our shores? Because Jesus is not willing that any should perish and that all should come to repentance. And um, I, I think that I, I want to just kind of close the, this uh, portion here with, with having you watch something, if you would, because this really helped me as a, a pastor of a local congregation in trying to not just become a maintenance organization or just fellowshipping within, but actually look outside. Would you watch this with me? And I guess the thing that I would ask you is I have to ask myself too, are we uh, a life-saving station or are we a Christian club? Uh, you exist for a reason. You exist for a purpose of being able to reach out. And you know, this is a great time in the history of this church to do it. You don't have a pastor. You don't have a youth pastor right now. 
And it really kind of forces you to say, what are we going to do here? Do we just kind of wait and, and abide here? Uh, or do we do what we, what we know God has done in our own lives? Can we share, can we witness what Christ is doing? 150 years ago, uh, there was a 50-year-old lady that uh, was asked to speak to a group of, of working men down in New York City on a hot evening. As she was speaking to this group of men, she felt it impressed upon her mind, and it wouldn't leave her, that there was some mother's son that was out there in that audience that had left his home, mother's home, and his mother's teaching, and that he would either be rescued that night or he would be lost. And so in the course of her conversation with the men that were there, she, she mentioned if, if there is a young person here tonight that has left his home and his, the teaching that he grew up with, um, would you come and see me following the service? And after the service was completed, there was an 18-year-old boy who came forward and saying, were you talking to me? And... Uh, he said, I promised my mom that I would be with her in heaven, but the way that I'm living right now, I know that that would be impossible. And so she spent time talking with him about the gospel. And at the end of that, he said, I feel now that I can go to heaven and be with my mom because I have found God. And that lady, the ne during the next couple of days, was, that was so profoundly influenced upon her mind that she wrote the testimony of that. And you, it's interestingly enough, you've got that splashed all over inside this church in your hymn book, and number 299. That lady's name was Fanny Crosby. And she, she wrote that little testimonial. She says, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Weep o'er the erring one. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Yes, rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. And he's still in the business of saving today. And I would simply encourage you to don't let go of the mission just because you don't have a pastor standing here in the pulpit every single week, or a youth pastor to help you. You know what Christ has done in your life. Let others know about that. Can I pray with you right now? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to meet with this good congregation of people right now, Lord. And I would just pray that uh, this might be indeed a life-saving station here. They've got a beautiful facility, Lord. And I know that uh, there are people that will walk inside these doors if they're invited. And Lord, we pray that each one would take that opportunity to pray for them, for, for the openness of heart and the part of these people, that they would pray for an opportunity to share and that they would open their mouth and say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Lord, we pray that as a result, there might be many that would come to know Christ here at Panama Baptist Church. For it's in his name we pray, amen. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for that challenge. And believe it or not, guys, I don't tell these guys when they come in to preach what we heard about the week before or ask them to preach on a particular subject, but isn't it interesting what God has laid on their hearts and how the sermons the last couple of weeks have been pushing us towards what Dan just uh, shared with us here today. Last week we talked about our gifts. <clears throat> and we know the Lord has given us all wonderful gifts that we can use not just inside of this, these four walls but outside of these walls as well. So again, thank you for this encouraging message today for us to get out there and be the, the church in the community because that's where we really need to be. With that said now, this afternoon we have a special event with a soup and Sunday downstairs. So there's been a lot of soups that I've been smelling. 
when I was out there earlier coming up the stairs. And, uh, and I do even believe there's a couple chilies down there. Now, Ryan, where's Ryan? Did you bring that bacon soup? No, no bacon soup. We're all wondering about this bacon soup coming up. Um, and just before we're, we're dismissed, I got a couple more announcements I just want to run through you. We're going to pray up here for the meal that's going to be prepared downstairs. So when we're dismissed, feel free to go downstairs and go right through the line there and, and get your food. I would encourage you to, when, when you're sitting in the fellowship hall, Maybe sit with someone that you don't normally sit with or someone that you don't know. Get to know them. We're a family. We want to be that family. And without that connection here, um, if you don't know them, get to know them. Share some things with them. And let's be a family here today. Um, just as a quick reminder, tomorrow night we have a pastoral search team meeting. Um, and then Tuesday is the deacons meeting. And, and as Dan was sharing us, be prepared for that open door. Have prepared in your heart and in your mind of what God has done for you. So when that door opens and someone asks, you have that prepared. And again, be willing to share how God has helped you. And then as a reminder, who are you going to invite this week? As he mentioned, 18 people out of the, the you come in contact with this week will not be coming to church because they weren't invited. Who are you going to invite this week? With that, if you guys would like to step to the back of the church, we'll close in a word of prayer and uh, give uh, the blessing for the food downstairs. Dear Heavenly Father, again, Lord, just thank you for Dan and the heart that he has to share with us and uh, what's laid on his heart for us here today, Lord, and the encouragement that he gave us that even without a shepherd up here, Lord, the flock knows what needs to be done. And we know your word, Lord, and that we can act out on that. And Lord, as we head out here from these four walls this week, let us be that light that he was talking about in our community that would draw people towards us as that darkness gets darker and darker, Lord. And Lord, as we gather here today for a fellowship Sunday, that we get to know one another, not just names, but get to know them intimately as a family, Lord. That we can share stories, hardships, troubles, laughs, and tears, Lord. Lord, we just want to thank you for this food that's been prepared. And the hands that prepared it and the farmers that produced it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.